Hi there. From the dawn of history, the sea has had a remarkable grip on men's imaginations. It's provided us with countless tales of adventure, from Homer's Odyssey to Treasure Island and Moby Dick. And, of course, it's inspired great deeds of exploration. In the year of 1519, five ships sailed from Spain. Three years later, one of the five made it home after completing the first round-the-world trip. But it wasn't until 435 years later that anyone sailed all the way around the North American continent. The ships that accomplished this were cutters belonging to the U.S. Coast Guard. Steaming south from Boston Harbor, through the Panama Canal and up the Pacific Coast, they rounded Alaska and headed east along the top of the continent. Here, slowly, they made their way through the often solid ice of the Arctic Ocean. The last leg of that trip brought them down the east coast of Canada and back to Boston Harbor. Needless to say, this long and difficult voyage wasn't taken just for the fun of it. It was part of the Coast Guard's continuing program of service to the country and to navigation in general. We'll find out more about this as we follow their seagoing true adventure through the Northwest Passage. Beyond the frozen top of North America stretches the Arctic Ocean. There's nothing here except what men bring in during the short summer. Most of the year, the Arctic Ocean is nearly five and a half million square miles of solid ice. But the Arctic has become increasingly important in recent years. Dewline radar installations, for example, have to be supplied and maintained. But great stretches of these waters are almost completely unknown charting them will be one of the duties of the men aboard the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Bramble. Sailing out of Miami, the Bramble begins a four-month journey. Its passage across the top of the continent will realize, in a rather ironic way, the old dream of a Northwest passage to the Orient. European sailors were searching for it as early as 1498. John Cabot of Bristol tried twice he was followed by his son, Sebastian. His last effort set sail in 1553. Of course, it was a failure. But men continue to hope that there still might be a shortcut to the East Indies. Great explorers penetrated the Arctic. Men like Cartier, Frobisher, and many others, slowly they helped to paint a clearer picture of what that frozen world was really like. Finally, McClure, many years later, the great Norwegian explorer Amundsen, proved that such a passage might actually exist. Finding it would be one thing. Navigating it would be something else again. And so the Bramble heads south toward the Panama Canal. We're going the long way around. Shipboard routines and regular drills like this abandoned ship drill take up slack and tighten discipline. This is no pleasure cruise because we're going all the way around the North American continent. The trip from Miami is routine. Now we're at the canal. Electric mules ease us through the locks. In Gatun Lake, we pause for a washdown because this is fresh water. At the canal city of Balboa, the Bramble's crew gets ashore for a few hours of fun and liberty. Here we're joined by another Coast Guard cutter, the Spar. The Spar has come down here from her home port, Bristol, Rhode Island. Together, the two cutters will proceed up the west coast to Seattle, where we'll meet a third cutter, the Storis. And so, heading out onto the blue waters of the Pacific, the northward trip begins with the spar leading the way. From Panama, we logged 1,600 miles before making Acapulco our next stop. The men are hoping for a day ashore at Acapulco. From here, the city looks like a paradise of white beaches and luxury hotels. The lucky ones 
who make up the Liberty Party. They don't expect to have any trouble filling the hours ahead. Well, they fill the hours with fun and relaxation. But there's not much time at Acapulco. We're soon underway again. Before long, there's an emergency. One of the men has developed what may be appendicitis. In response to a radio message from the captain, a Coast Guard plane flies down from San Diego. The patient is put aboard our small boat and sets out to meet the PBM. In a few hours, he'll be in the hospital at San Diego. With luck, he'll be able to rejoin us when we reach Seattle. There's a long stretch of ocean from Acapulco to Seattle, and a lot of it rough. Our appendix case got away just in time. At Seattle, we find some of the 96 ships that will be taking supplies to the Arctic this summer. And waiting for us is the Coast Guard Cutter Storus. The Storus will be our flagship. She's been on a similar survey before. Before we leave, though, the Spar and the Bramble will take on additional supplies and special equipment. Seattle is to be our last port of call before we return to the East Coast by way of the Northwest Passage. Another veteran of the Arctic waters is the Navy icebreaker Burton Island. She'll be along as part of the main operational force. The equipment coming aboard now belongs to the Navy's Hydrographic Survey Group. The Coast Guard cutters will work with the group in sounding, in charting, and in establishing navigational aids along the route that we'll be surveying, hoping to find the Northwest Passage. The arrival of an emergency heater reminds us that we may wind up staying in the ice for quite a while. No one can predict the whims of an ice pack. July 1st, the second week of summer. Our ships start moving for the long journey northward. The icebreaker, Burton Island, has gone ahead. She'll rendezvous with us where the first ice appears. We'll be followed soon by the supply ships of the Military Sea Transportation Service. And then we rendezvous with the Burton Island as we cross the Arctic Circle, where the first ice appears. It is now July 12th, and we're approaching Point Barrow. We're moving into the area about two weeks earlier than any previous ships. So, we're likely to run into ice fields near shore. Still, we hope we'll be able to put the extra time up here to good use. There's a lot of work to be done. We pass Point Barrow. We turn into the Beaufort Sea. Now we're moving eastward. Although we're early, the ice pack is already beginning to recede from the shore. So we make good progress. This is the longest leg of our journey. From Seattle up through the Bering Strait and around Alaska to find the Northwest Passage. Our first stop will be at the Dewline Station at Cape Perry. We reach Cape Perry on July 17th. The helicopter from the Storis takes off to pick up mail ashore. Cape Perry's outgoing mail comes aboard the Bramble. At the entrance to Amundsen Gulf, the cutters refuel from the Burton Island. When this is done, the icebreaker will head back to pick up the resupply ships and guide them through the ice fields. Meantime, the cutters move ahead by themselves. 
The ice is getting thicker. The uncharted areas are still some distance ahead. But even here in Amundsen Gulf, we make a point of sounding and charting as we go. Areas that were charted and fairly clear last year now seem to be almost solid ice fields. Needless to say, we didn't come up here completely unprepared. Before leaving Miami, the Bramble's hull was given a special protective sheathing. A new kind of propeller was installed, especially designed for work on heavy ice. But even so, before long, all three cutters are beset in ice, solidly stopped. Sometimes an open area of water will suddenly appear in the ice, but you can't wait for that to happen. So the Bramble rigs a boom with a heavy weight. We'll use this to try to roll the ship free. Meantime, the Storis sends a helicopter out to look for leads or open areas that we can make for once we get free, if we get free. The cutters back up and pound onto the ice. Ice like this can only be made to yield by using massive force again and again. Sometimes it looks as though we've met the legendary immovable object. As long as the ships have some freedom of movement, they have a fair chance of breaking through a nearby open lead but the ice close in again and holds the ships dead still, unable to move. The Arctic ice has closed in. The Coast Guard cutters can't even move. Now we'll try to shatter the ice with explosives. Now a big grapnel is brought into use. The ship's engines go to work again. But in the end, it isn't the explosives of the engines that free the ships. It's the shifting currents and winds that move the ice and help create a passage. But ice fields are tricky and unpredictable. Soon, we're in trouble again as the ice closes in. The forces that an ice field can exert are hard to believe. What was a reasonably open lead not too many hours ago has closed up under the ships, forcing them higher and higher off the water. The ice has actually pushed two of the cutters against each other, giving one a very bad list to starboard. The spar manages to break free and moves in to aid the bramble. The storis has freed herself too, and so it goes, hour after hour, mile after slow mile. Often no progress at all, but then we're looking for the Northwest Passage. Finally, the Storis leads us out of the ice pack toward open water. Here we pass a young native about to take his daily bath. Or is he? Nope, the water's too cold even for him. Well, we've proved that the route is passable in spite of the ice. And so the resupply ships should manage to get through. From here on, we'll set out buoys to mark a safe track for them to follow. The ones set out here in previous years have been moved about by the action of the ice field.
Now here's a job for you. In Cambridge Bay, we take on an important job. Experienced frogmen go below to examine the ship's hulls and propellers for possible damage. And that water is cold. On the 6th of August, we get our first liberty ashore in what seems like a very long, long time. The terrain isn't exactly inviting. And there's work to be done, too. But we have a chance to make friends with some Eskimo children and their family of husky dogs. The Navy's Hydrographic Survey Group can now begin work ashore. One of their tasks will be to establish locations for various aids to navigation. We'll set these up on the shores of Cambridge Bay. Coming ashore now are parts of a radar reflector tower. It's made of a very strong but lightweight material. Crewmen carry it to where the hydrographic survey group has decided it should go. Now the subsoil in these Arctic regions is always frozen, just like concrete. So we have to drill into it. Once the holes are drilled, assembling the tower is quick and an easy job. And then once it's up, the tower will be visible by day and discernible to shipboard radar by night. Just one more example of the Coast Guard's program of aids to navigation. The Storis guides some of the resupply ships through a narrow channel. And then we push forward. We're now headed for the uncharted area between Shepherd Bay and Bellow Strait. We'll try to establish the last link in the long sought west to east route across the top of the continent, the Northwest Passage. As our journey continues, we note locations and islands and channels. We establish exact locations for the track. This with soundings made for water depths will permit this new route to be plotted on charts for the first time in the history of navigation. From Cape Perry, we've pushed our way through the ice of Amundsen's Gulf. We've dropped buoys, erected radar towers, and sounded through Queen Maud Gulf and Simpson Strait. Now we're approaching the western entrance to Below Strait. This is the first time that a complete route has been charted. A Canadian icebreaker, HMCS Labrador, is waiting for us at the western approaches to Below Strait. The Labrador and the three Coast Guard cutters nest at False Strait before starting the next leg of their journey. But already the cutters have accomplished what they set out to do. They've charted a western escape route for the ships supplying the Dewline stations protecting America from attack from a foreign aggressor. The passage through Below Strait begins September 6th. With the Labrador and the Storis leading the way, we make the turn into Below Strait. Looking astern from the Bramble, we see the spar following us through. A while ago, we spoke of the Northwest Passage that men began looking for in the year of 1498. Well, now we've seen it. And radio men aboard our ships tell the world about it. The Northwest Passage for deep draft ships is a long, dangerous route through Arctic ice fields. It's no wonder that none of the great sea captains of the age of exploration managed to find it. Even today, with the best ships we can build, Getting through it is no easy matter, but now the hardest part of the journey is over. Near the eastern end of Bellow Strait, 
lies an abandoned Hudson's Bay outpost. Nearby, there's a rock cairn containing the records of early explorers. Our own itinerary and sailing lists are placed among them by Captain Thomas Pullen of the Labrador. Now our cutters head for Lancaster Sound, and from there start for home by way of Baffin Bay. We've seen all the ice we care to see for quite a while, but of course there's quite a bit more to come in the form of icebergs, the kind that sunk the Titanic. They come in all sizes and shapes, and we give them a wide berth. A month ago, we were caught in the ice and couldn't move. We're moving now, though. But what's important is this. We prove that supply ships crossing North America from the east can escape by the eastern route if the ice should prevent their return by way of Point Barrow. Then, there it is. Boston, Massachusetts, the date, September 24th. There's a hearty welcome waiting for us. The Storis leads us in. The spar has continued on to her home port, Bristol, Rhode Island. The men of the Bramble and the Storis will have to sail on to Miami and Seattle to complete going all the way round North America. But this is where we get to celebrate our trip through the legendary Northwest Passage. The Northwest Passage, yes, We've been there, but it's great to be home. At Bristol, Rhode Island, the Cutter Spar is returning to her home port. And family and friends watch her tie up. This isn't just a ship's arrival, it's a real homecoming. And there's no sight better to a sailor than to see his family. Not many men have sailed across the top of the continent, but this is a scene that's been played for as long as men have been going to sea. Commemorating the historic voyage, Rear Admiral Henry Perkins presents this plaque to the captain of the spar. The first three deep water ships to sail around North America in one season from west to east. Bristol to Bristol, the spar. Miami to Miami, the Bramble. Seattle to Seattle, the Storis. The Bramble is almost home now. It won't be long. A porthole gets cleaned, and there are flags flying, including the Bramble's Northwest Passage flag. And so, the Bramble returns to Miami. She's been away more than four months, making history. We've been watching the men of the U.S. Coast Guard in action but we've seen only one facet of the work they do. Actually, they have many responsibilities on shore and off, including law enforcement, safety, and military readiness. Their search and rescue operations save about 5,000 human lives a year, not to mention millions of dollars worth of property. And of course, the work they do on aids to navigation helps make ocean travel safer every year. Well, I hope you've enjoyed sharing our visit with them. Until we meet again, this is Bill Burrard saying, may all your adventures be happy ones.